thing I hate most about the Academy Awards <laughs> is uh, <laughs> the thank yous. But, you know, there's certain people I, I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank Lillian Fisher, who's not here today because she's sick. Many of, many of you know her, and uh, I wish she were here. My daughter, Jennifer, who is the CEO of Team in America, and just bought how, how many books? A lot. Five books. <laughs> and, uh, and they go to Rogue. I know. She wants to exchange them. <laughs> and my uh, partner for 343 years, <laughs> Joanne. Yay. They're just amazing people and amazing talents. And the ensemble that works here at Rogue is an amazing ensemble. Uh, this theater, if you don't know it, you should get to know it. It's one of the, it has been given $10,000 by the American Theater Wing of the National Theater Award. I, I think they're the people that give the what is it, Emmys or Tony's Broadway Tony. shows? Uh, this is one of the ten best regional theaters in the country. Yeah. Right here. And if you don't believe it, come and see the show that's on now, if you can get tickets. Uh, it's it's a, an amazing show. You'd just be blown away and you think, in Tucson? I'm not in New York? <laughs> I want to thank Evan and Matt, who are truly world-class musicians. I want to thank Karen DeLay, Bill Sendel, and Petey and Jim Periel, who are all people, you may have people like this in your life who sort of, when you need something or you're in trouble, somebody sort of sneaks in the back door and they help you out. That's uh, Karen and Bill and Petey and Jim. And Jim's sitting there behind the <laughs> camera, which he's just learned to operate. Where uh, do you get my bill? <laughs> yeah. And uh, Steve Cowett is, is a friend and a, a major mover in the world of contemporary poetry. He's just an amazing poet. And uh, he's also an amazing man, if you can stand to be around him long enough. <laughs> 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 uh, he's a tireless activist for animal rights, civil rights, human rights, any rights you can name, he is for. He's donating all of his income, travel expenses, to Feeding America because he's from San Diego and Feeding America's in San Diego. His poetry, how do you describe his poetry? He's the reason I became a poet. When I read his introduction and his introduction there, what he thought poetry should be. He was talking about poetry that was called easy, easy to read but not to write. It was an underground poetry that avoided the preciousness, self-conscious diction of mainstream verse on the one hand and the unrelenting incoherence of conventional avant-garde poetry on the other. It was gritty, raw, anecdotal, often funny, and seemed to us decidedly more interesting than the rather solemn stuff being touted by the respectable quarterlies. It was our contention that if the public had turned away from poetry, it was due not to the perniciousness influence, pernicious influence of television or the incompetence of our schools or the technocratic bias of the culture, but simply to the fact that most of what was being published was ponderously obtuse and unrelievably dull. <laughs> when I read that, I thought, hell, I can be a poet. <laughs> I had no idea that anybody could talk like that. And, and here's, here's what summarizes 
Steve, uh, the best. Thomas Lux, a, a famous contemporary poet, wrote on the back, his blurb on the back of Steve's book. I love Coet's poems. He has more energy, more passion, more fire, and more humor in his left little fingernail. I'll notice he said, fingernail, <laughs> than most poets have in their whole bodies. And that's true. That's true. So, Steve, it's yours. I'm not really Steve Cowett, but he couldn't show up, so they asked me to read in his stead. Thanks, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan and I were talking on the, uh, the phone a few days ago, and I told him I was planning to read for two hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> and there was a really long, long silence. And he said if I did that, he would shoot me. And not with a gun but with a bow and arrow, and he said, I am not a good shot. <laughs> so that if I aim for the heart, I might miss. And you might suffer. <laughs> and it reminded me, of course, of a poem that I always tend to like to read at my readings. Uh, those of you who attend lots of poetry readings know that every now and then you go to a reading that never ends, where the poet keeps thinking, well, they didn't really like my first 14 or 15 poems, but these next three are going to blow them out of the water, I know, and, they, you know, and it never ends. And I went to a reading like that many years ago. I've been to many of those, but this one at Dennis Will's bookstore in La Jolla, and uh, the guy was a pretty good poet, actually, and after a long time, must have been a couple of hours, I thought, I realized he was reading from his new book, and he wasn't selecting poems from the book. He was reading page after page of the book, and he was only like halfway through. And at that moment, I realized I was in hell. And this particular poem came to me called, I Attend a Poetry Reading. You can all hear me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can I be heard? The fellow reading poetry at us wouldn't stop. Nothing would dissuade him. Not the stifling heat, the smoky walls with their illuminated clocks, our host who shifted anxiously from foot to foot. Polite applause had stiffened to an icy silence. No one clapped or nodded. No one sighed. Surely he must understand that we had families waiting for us. <laughs> Jobs we had to get to in the morning. That chair was murdering my back. The cappuccino tasted unaccountably of uric acid. <laughs> Lurid bullfight posters flickered in the red fluorescent light, and suddenly I knew that I had died. <laughs> and for those much too windy readings of my own, had been condemned to sit forever in this damn cafe. A squadron of enormous flies buzzed around the cup of piss I had been drinking from. Up at the mic, our poet of the evening grinned and flipped his tail. <laughs> <laughs>
and kept on reading. <laughs> There's something I forgot to say that's very important that Steve just reminded me of. This show will last about an hour and a half <laughs> without an intermission. So if you feel the urge to use the facilities, please just, you don't have to raise a hand. But we charge. We do charge. <laughs> quarter, we'll collect quarter. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I That's forgot good. to say that. That's good. You know, people, yeah. we yeah. don't intend to go on. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm going to read about 40 minutes. Dan will read about 40 minutes. Um, decades ago, when I was living in New York, um, I would take the subway. There was a period when I was working in Midtown Manhattan as a movie usher. I was a young man at the time. And I would take the subway and I'd walk from my apartment on the Lower Reef side uh, to the subway and I'd pass the five spot. And Thelonious Monk was playing uh, a, a very famous gig there because he had not been permitted to play. He had lost his cabaret license because of a, a drug bust many years before. And so for many years he had not been allowed to perform in New York. And when he started performing in New York again, his reputation nationally soared. It, he was at the top of his game. He made the cover of, of Time magazine. And every now and then, when I would pass in the evening, pass the five spot, I would see Monk between sets, and he'd be walking back and forth, uh, obviously either listening to music in his head or composing uh, music. And, uh, once I saw him open a cab door uh, for a couple who were coming to hear Monk, and they thought he was the doorman, <laughs> and Arnold went in. And um, the other little anecdote in, in this little poem called Solo Monk uh, was told to me by Ricky Cornell, an old friend from many, many years ago, who was the day bartender. And she told me this little story of Charlie Mingus and Thelonious Monk having this funny little conversation uh, in, the, in the five spot. And the poem is called Solo Monk. One day, back in the 60s, Monk was sitting at the piano, Charlie Mingus pulling at his coat how Monk should put the word in so the Mingus group could play the five spot, seeing as how Monk's already legendary gig down there was ending. Mingus, all persuasion and cajolery, ran it down for 20 minutes till he capped it with the comment, dig it, Thelonious. You know we black brothers got to stick together. At which point, Monk, laconic to a fault, till then he hadn't said a word, turned slowly with a sidewise glance and raised one eyebrow. Man, he said, I thought you was Chinese. <laughs> and evenings between sets, Monk would pace outside the five spot, head cocked to some inner keyboard with that listing gait of his, that wispy black goatee that rumpled herringbone tweed hat he sported in those days. He paced that corner, solitary and quixotic, in a rapture of exploding chords. All angular and dissonant and oddly phrased. One summer night, 
a checker cab pulled up as he was so engaged, and Monk, who happened to be passing at that moment, swung back the door, then stepped so quietly and self-effacingly behind it that you would have thought it was his calling. But his ear, as ever, cocked to that imaginary keyboard. An elegant patrician couple clubbing blonde Westchester money stepped out on 8th Street like an ad for Chivas Regal. As the primped fox sashayed past him in her saffron strapless, tossing back her golden mane, her escort nodded vaguely, not so much as glancing up at that solicitous, albeit altogether funky looking colored doorman with the goofy hat. A gesture almost too indifferent to be haughty. And with that they hurried past and disappeared into the five spot, having come to hear the legendary monk. That droll and idiosyncratic piano. The sensation, Whitney Balliot wrote, of missing the bottom step in the dark. Eerie, isn't it, to hear him playing, though he's dead, Mary said, playing Monk the night we heard he had died. And she lowered the dust cover over the turntable as quietly as Monk had shut the door of that checkered cab and turning without sign or gesture had gone off bopping down the street, head cocked as ever to one side and circled by the halo of that rumpled hat, oblivious, preoccupied, lost, in the sweet jazz of the night. Monk on 8th Street at the end of summer in the early 60s. Must have been around 1155. each and my wife said that's too much so I'm giving them away so if you go out you can take one you know take either the post if you feel like it the poster or the postcard uh, of the poem um, a poem called Raymond Jesus comes back like he said he would a stand-up kind of guy, 
unassuming to a fault, but rock solid. <laughs> the shy type, everyone likes, but no one thinks much about one way or the other. Until one evening, during a storm, tooling down I-15 in his beat-up VW bug, he passes one of those awful two-car smash-ups and pulling to the shoulder, hops out, strolls past the paramedics and cops, and before they can think to stop him, kneels into all that shattered glass by the gurneys and sheets. And with a few incomprehensible words, in a language nobody has spoken in 2,000 years, coaxes the dead back to life. The little kid gets back his severed leg, and all that blood on the road disappears like a bottle of trick ink. Then everyone starts waking up, even the drunk in the Chevy, sober for once, and looking sheepish as hell. Thank God, he thinks, no one was hurt. Outraged, the cops wrestle Jesus to the mud, snap on the cuffs, and toss him in the back of their squad car. But when they're done helping the two ladies and the kid to their feet and walk back, the cuffs are on the dashboard and their black K-9 lab retriever is curled in the guy's lap. <clears throat> Jesus scratching the fellow behind the ears, something no one's thought to do since he was a pup. Listen, <clears throat> you know as well as I that none of this is true. Just the story I made up about the world we would like to have been born into. That world where nothing that we love has to die. But the lab retriever I was thinking of was real. Our sweet, beloved Raymond gone many years now, his black bushy tail twitching happily in his sleep as he'd lie at the foot of our bed the way he used to. have out there, I just thought of it, this little solo monk poem. And I don't have a lot of copies out there. I might have some more here and I'll put it on the table. But I have about 10 or 15 of these and you could take one of these too. Either pay me $70 or free. Those are the only <laughs> two options. <laughs> this was, was designed by a friend of mine many years ago in San Diego. Uh, here's a love poem for my wife. We've been married for 48 years. And uh, I really like her. Uh, <laughs> she's wonderful. And uh, I was listening, who was I listening to uh, driving up with the line? Uh, who was I listening to? Connie Dover, I think it was. Uh, I don't know who it was. Uh, but when love grows old, it grows so cold. And I was thinking, no, 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 not at all. That's simply uh, not true. I mean, if it's real love, it doesn't grow cold in the least. It, it... And so this is a poem for my wife, but it's also for the land I live on. I live way up in the country, uh, and it's for the little wonderful animals in my land, the gophers and the rabbits and, and the frogs and every now the coyote. I live on a dirt road, Coyote Holler Road. Uh, used to be lots of coyotes there. 
and it's about a cat of mine who brought a gopher into the house one day many years ago, and just that story. The blue dress. Big Eddie is a cat of mine, was a cat of mine, beloved animal, also buried on my land now. When I grab Big Eddie, the gopher drops from his teeth and bolts for the closet, vanishing into a clutter of shoes and valises and vacuum attachments and endless crates of miscellaneous rubbish, grumbling and cursing, carton by carton. I lug everything out, that mountain of hopeless detritus, until with no place to hide, he breaks for the other side of the room. And I have him at last, trapped in a corner, tiny and trembling. I lower the plastic freezer bowl over his head and boom, slam the thing down. Got him, I yell out, slipping a folder under the edge for a lid. But when I open the front door, it's teeming, a rain so fierce, it drives me back into the house and before I can wriggle into my sneakers, Mary, impatient, has grabbed the contraption out of my hands and run off into the yard with it barefoot. She's wearing that blue house dress. I know just where she's headed. That big mossy boulder down by the oleanders across from the shed. And I know what she'll do when she gets there. Hunker down, slip off the folder, let the thing slide to the ground while she speaks to it softly, whispers encouraging, comforting things. <laughs> Only after the gopher takes a few tentative steps, dazed, not comprehending how he got back to his own world, then tries to run off, will she know how he's fared? if he's wounded, or stunned, or okay. Depraved ravisher of our gladiolus and roses, but neighbor and kin nonetheless. <laughs> Big Eddie meows at my feet while I stand by the window over the sink watching her run back through the rain, full of good news, triumphant, laughing, wind lashing the trees. It's hard to fathom how gorgeous she looks, running like that through the storm, that blue sheath of a dress aglow in the smoky haze, that luminous blue dress pasted by rain to her hips. I stand at the window, grinning, amazed at my own undeserved luck, at a life that I still, when I think of it, hardly believe. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, uh, they wanted to take me to Vietnam many years ago. I was in the Army Reserves. I was in the Army Reserves because uh, they refused my, they rejected my CO, my conscientious uh, objector status petition. Uh, the Coney Island Draft Board, when they asked me who my spiritual teachers were, uh, I thought quickly and I said Bertrand Russell and Henry David Thoreau. And I should have said Rabbi Shlomo Blomo and, you know, uh, Father Gilligan Milligan. And that was maybe the mistake I made. So they rejected. I went into the Army Reserves. I got out six months later. But then Vietnam heated up and they were going to take all the reservists back. And I knew there was no way in hell I was going to go uh, fight for uh, this most uh, sociopathic of nations. And uh, so I wrote them a letter. I wrote the army a letter of resignation. <laughs> and they sent army intelligence after me. And this is the story, it's absolutely the story. Some of you uh, who know the Bay Area might know the Hallinan family, uh, great uh, 
radical family. They used to do a lot of pro bono work. Butch Hallinan had just gotten out of law school. And this is the story exactly, I think, as it happened. A, it's called A Note Concerning My Military Career. <laughs> After I'd sent the army my letter of resignation, two beefy intelligence types showed up at my place in the Fillmore with a huge reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And without mincing words, I tore into America's despicable agenda, the circle of hell reserved for the savage carpet bombing campaign against the people of Vietnam and the puppet state that the U.S. was trying to force down their throats. Which was why, I explained, I wouldn't put their fucking uniform on ever again. And why if I had to fight, it would be for the other side. <laughs> Quiet, courteous, polite. They sat there for two hours, listening to my ferocious rant, till I asked what exactly it was they needed to know. <laughs> and one of them said they had really been sent to find out if I was planning to shoot President Johnson, <laughs> or do something else of that sort. And I laughed and said no, and we shook hands, and they packed up and left. But a month later, when the Army sent me the transcript <coughs> to sign and return, I brought it instead to a young San Francisco attorney whose family firm did pro bono work for resistors. And Butch Hallinan read that whole 18-page harangue and looked up and told me how much he liked what I'd said. And when I asked him what to do next, he advised me to get the hell out of town as fast as I could, which I did. I ran for my life and for the lives of all those they were trying to get me to kill. And of nothing I've done in this world have I ever been prouder. Listen, if you're reading this poem and you're young or desperate enough to think of enlisting or have already been suckered in, understand that despite all those self-righteous fairy tales about freedom and peace, this nation has been, from its genocidal beginnings, addicted to empire, plunder, and perpetual war. Those combat flips you watched as a kid, and the sanctimonious propaganda that passes for news, and the swaggering, hawkish prattle puked from the lips of our politicians and pundits that spew stinking of corpses and money are meant to convince young men and women like you to massacre city by city and village by village America's villain du jour, adding every few years another small state that stepped out of line to its necklace of skulls. And for those of you who will march to your own graves in so doing, the powers that sent you will bow their heads and present to your folks the flag that was draped on the box they carted you home in. Friend, find any way that you can to resist or escape. If you have to run for your life, for Christ's sake, run for your life.
That's my patriotic poem. <laughs> I told uh, Nora, David, and Judy yesterday morning, we were chat sitting around chatting, and I said, rape and murder are horrifying crimes. But I believe that patriotism is perhaps even worse. Patriotism means tribal allegiance, means that you love the home team. That's what the good German was. The good German was an intelligent, well-educated man or woman who supported his country, her country, the fatherland. Otherwise, he or she would be a traitor, right? Patriotism is not a virtue, it seems to me, to put it mildly. Here's the last one, called Cherish. If you knew the academic world of the 1980s and 90s, you would know that in rhetoric and, and literature, English departments uh, of universities, critical theory took over. And people were talking highfalutin theory all the time. And theory, you know, if you were a grad student, you had better know that language and you better talk that language and at least pretend that you took all that BS seriously. And I saw a, um, a blurb for a uh, literary magazine that reminded me of all that stuff. It said, we are not interested in the poetry of nostalgia. This is a magazine you know, that you were going to send work to. And what it really means is nothing about your life, nothing personal. What they wanted was that esoteric stuff Dan was talking about. Uh, earlier on, all that highfalutin, very impressive stuff where you say, oh, uh, that's just too sophisticated for me, but I'm sure it's a wonderful poem, that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, the language poets came out of this theory, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Paul Deman, uh, all, all those highfalutin critics. And I was thinking of that absurd, esoteric, nonsensical language, so I mixed that in to this poem about that subject, a kind of argument with all that, called Cherish. And so a lot of that language is woven through. Yes, of course, the sign and the thing in itself are in no manner the same. It goes without saying. We all understand the grammatological nature of metaphonemic and proto-factual discourse. <laughs> what Trubetskoy would surely have called the contingent glossomatics of the indeterminate text. But the trouble is, notwithstanding all that, the past won't shut up, won't leave me in peace. I want it all back. Not the nomenclature of epistemic linguistics or some sort of post-dialectic mode of discursive assertion, but rather my folks in that cozy doorway in Flatbush, that house on 14th Street, Carol's old piano, Mickey's black wooden attorney at law sign hung from the window over that shingled hatch to the basement and that little storefront on 10th where I hawked circle line tours of Manhattan my booth at the magic carpet, just off the boardwalk in Coney Island, three blocks from Nathan's, the North Atlantic pounding away at my back, that movie house in Miami where the black patrons had to sit in the balcony. I could hardly fucking believe it and work there with a bad conscience for two months. Would they have me abandon the past, devote what time I have left to the unstable nature of syntax, the manipulation of self-referential lexical signs? I, the most shameless and least esoteric of singers, I who wish no more than to remember and cherish I, who now, to my own grief, understand well in the words of Nikonor Para, 
that the decades have wings. Despite the indeterminate, self-defeating, problematics of verbal representation, I insist that furnished place up on 92nd off Amsterdam Avenue really exists, or did. And those evenings spent haunting the failure, those ancient rainy Chaplin and Marx Brothers slapsticks, and that woman I brought home one night from the Cedar Bar where Franz Klein used to hold court. Not a structural coefficient of syntactic presence, but an actual woman. George Antile's old flame. An evening I spent there with Duncan and the week Jim Fraser came back from his pilgrimage to the Scottish Highlands sporting kilts and he and I took that place together off Avenue B where Carol Berger lived with Peter. And Sandra Scopatone had a place just down the hall. Suzuki Bean, already a raging success, and a flight above me Bill Merwin and Moira. One morning, trembling, I sat on a bench in Tompkins Square Park, ingesting that first City Lights edition of Howl, that ferocious title American Rant, like those earlier days when I'd ride the Brighton Express reading Whitman and weeping. It was Alan himself one night after a reading at St. Mark's a good decade later, who introduced me to Potter, whom he knew I adored. And I stood there, stupidly shaking, my, shaking his hand with nothing to say. To hell with the signifier's oblique figurations, the nomos of indeterminate linguistic praxis. It's those mornings waking with Rosie, my first love back there on 6th Street, the past even now inexpressibly present. The evening that Jane and Wendy dragged me to Gertie's Folk City to watch some kid named Dylan wailing over the mic. Diane, this time around, I'll let you do that strip tease at the party. Why the hell not? Then we'll head back to my place. No, this time I'm not going to stop you. Nor do I mean to ever forget your sister dying like that so suddenly, so young. Cassidy, too, gone now forever. And Joan and Linda and Jeremy, John, Dennis and Greg and Mickey and Doug and that large, loving, boisterous tribe of aunts and uncles and cousins, Sally and Gertie and Manus and Mark and George, Terry and Molly and Willie and Nat. I want to be there again, those teeming streets of downtown Manhattan, those lower east side cafes, all those poets and dopers and crazies back in the 60s, the friends that I'll never now get to cherish enough. Alan Cohn and Faye Goldman and lovely, voluptuous Billy Grayson out on the Tilden Clay courts. Is Eddie DeMarco alive? Is Vinnie? Lou Lipton? Marilyn Branscombe? Cherish, cherish, that's all I can tell you. Sign and signifier be damned. No one and nothing down here is going to last. You know it too. Nikonor Pada. Wasn't he right on the money, though the days drag their feet and the weeks creep ever so slowly along? The decades have wings. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.
Thank you.